talking about quoting the British Army in the North in the context of the American Revolution, specifically places like this, Michelin Mackinac, uh, Quebec, and so on. Uh, we're going to be talking a bit about indigenous individuals uh, as well and French Canadians and where we got the information for uh, the clothing that we ended up using in the British in the period. So, uh, we're going to have a bit of an overview on climate and context, the blanket coat, the Canada cap, mittens, snowshoes, sleeved under waistcoats, and then as well women in the context of our region. Starting off, we need to be aware of where we're actually operating when we're talking about the army in the north. We're talking about the western, uh, the western outposts, uh, all the way from modern day northern Michigan, uh, places like Michelin Mackinac, uh, Old Fort Niagara itself that we're at right now, uh, Fort Erie, Oswegatchie, Montreal, all the way to Quebec in northeastern Quebec. These are places where we're dealing with extreme weather. Uh, minus 38 degrees Celsius to minus 36 degrees Fahrenheit is the average temperature that we're looking at within the period. Uh, that means that not only is the temperature sub-zero uh, sub uh, when it comes to Celsius, the temperature of freezing water, we're talking about the temperature of mercury itself freezing. So in fact, the temperature could be significantly lower uh, than what we actually have recorded. But at that point in time, mercury is frozen. We can't tell if it's actually below that temperature. Just give you some context about how cold it was. Uh, these are areas with excessive snowfall. So we have to deal with not just keeping warm, but keeping dry and being able to actually cross the terrain that we're dealing with as well. And primarily in the context of the areas we're looking at, it's actually swamps, frozen uh, wilderness and forests. So individuals have to be able to move rapidly through dense forests as well as narrow forests through swamps and stay dry. This is obviously not something that's easy to achieve. But the people who are most familiar with this are the French Canadians and the indigenous individuals. They're the ones that the British Army often copied uh, practices from in order to be able to adapt to the surroundings. Uh, they have familiarity with the terrain, with being able to actually handle operating uh, in this climate in the terrain that we're looking at, such as the forests and the swamps. They have proven practices over generations, in many cases hundreds of years, of operating in these areas, of living here and thriving here. And obviously, we have significant cultural influence uh, from the indigenous uh, communities being passed on to French Canadians, and eventually through contact with, um, with the French Canadians and indigenous communities, the British start adopting these things before the American Revolution, as well as through it. So we're talking about the Seven Years' War, after that, and then the British era and what used to be New France. Part of this is also the pre-war exposure that commanders had in North America. Before the war starting, they're operating across places like New York, modern-day Michigan, Ontario, Quebec. Uh, they know exactly where they're dealing uh, with in, ter uh, in terms of the locations they're operating from. They know the weather and they've now made these cultural connections to be able to have the knowledge to adapt to the climate. So these aren't people who aren't familiar with the areas, they've been here for many years, and now they know exactly what they need in order to adapt. A good example that we have here is actually the French Canadians in uh, the early 1780s in Canada. This image uh, from the Royal Ontario Museum is pretty important because it actually shows us the clothing and the lifestyle of indigenous people should rather accurately at the top, contrasted with French Canadians at the bottom. This is where we can get a significant amount of information in terms of what the average individual is using to help extrapolate so we know what the British Army actually looks like when they're making references to French Canadian clothing. We can see quite commonly used is the blanket coat, as I actually have myself at the moment, and if you look around you'll see that many individuals. It quite literally is made out of a blanket. In this case, these are made out of trade blankets. We can see that they're operating with mittens, as can be seen in the mitted person over here, and with snowshoes. So everything we're using in the British Army is based primarily off of what the French Canadians are using and what they adopted from the indigenous communities. Starting off, we have the blanket coat, or the capote, its origins. We can actually see it being used in the early, early 1700s, 1722. We have a Canadian hunter actually being depicted with a very simple coat. Um, these uh, capotes, as the French Canadians call them, didn't just come in white. They came in blue, in brown, um, in gray. Uh, white is actually one of the 
uh, less common colors, so you have a great deal of variety of what you can make it out of, as well as generally uh, thicker, heavier wools. We can see that indigenous individuals, as we're seeing in 1781, are still using the blanket with ties in certain cases earlier on in the, in the 1780s, uh, belted as well in certain instances, as we can see here with 1781. This one looks like it has ties around the neck, though it still has a belt around the waist as well. And then again, we're looking at the 1780s image of French Canadians, and extensively in this case, we're using ties. One of them has a belt in one, the ties are still being used. We have an early French Canadian woven belt as well, but again, ties all across the blanket coat to help actually secure it. So the blanket coat is something that they're using widely in this area. Now for the British, how common, how common was this? Especially in the context of reenactors and living historians, how should we be making use of this? Well, the answer is extensively. Really, there's absolutely no reason why someone should be wearing one if they're portraying the British Army or Provincial in the context of the American Revolution. The numbers that we're going to see for blanket coats actually number in the thousands. These are one of the most common garments that are being used in what is now present-day Canada and northern New York and Michigan. Uh, we can see in the Von German painting, sorry, uh, watercolor, a lot of details in terms of the blankets, the rosettes in the back, that uh, it's available, but they can actually be used to turn up the blanket coat to keep the ice and the snow from gathering around your legs to make it easier to walk and keep yourself dry. We can see the style of the blanket it's, well, itself, the traditional trade blanket, with the hood wrapped behind the shoulders, as if you were to look around the room, you'll see in many cases. Aaron's is actually a great example. His is pretty much lowered around the shoulders, just like the image itself. There's been some speculation as to whether it was a hood or something of that nature. Well, that answers it itself. When you actually put it into practice, you see it falls just like it does in the image itself. So there's not really any debate about that once you put it into practice to see how it looks. Uh, we can see from uh, Von Posch's journal in November 9th, 1776, how the blankets are actually made. It's pretty much an overcoat with a hood and cuffs, white woolen blankets with a blue stripe at the bottom of the coat. The hood and cuffs are heavy white, drawn tight with bright blue woolen tape and fastened down the front with toggles. Uh, rosettes are made of the same on the coattails. We can see that he mentions the word capote extensively. He's not saying blanket coat in most cases. He's actually using the phrase capote. Uh, toggles are interpretation, because this is translated from German into English in various copies, is that it would be the ties that we saw in the earlier examples. So again, essentially in the 1770s, definitely in the early 1780s, they are using ties for these. How common are they? Because I mentioned that they were pretty common. Well, we have quite a few examples right here. General Return Stores, May 1st, 1778. We have 1,350 blanket coats in St. John's. We have 142 in Montreal, made to the order of Lieutenant General Burgoyne. So these are going specifically to Burgoyne, as he requested. Another example, April 2nd, 1777, 41 coats being drawn by the King's Royal Regiment of New York. 1779, 360 blankets. In, and uh, sorry, 360 blanket coats and blankets in proportion to the soldiers. So they're all being given a blanket and a blanket coat. Interestingly, when we're looking at Calvin in 1780, we have soldiers that are arriving from Britain, and right away the soldiers are being given mittens, every single one of the soldiers, 5,550 uh, blankets for regulars, and the provincials are being given 3,000 blankets, again, with leggings and with mittens. So we're seeing 5,000 regular soldiers, over 3,000 provincials, they're all being given mittens, all of them. They're all being given blanket coats. They're being given blankets as well in many cases, and they are given leggings, in our case, as we're wearing here. So are they widely spread? Yes. Uh, extensively so. This is just a small section of what I've examined. There are other records where we're seeing a stores of blankets in places like St. Jean before the Americans attack and afterwards where we're talking about three, four, and five thousand, sometimes even seven thousand blankets in store just in places like St. Jean. So we're talking about not a few thousand, over ten thousand if not more being held in Quebec itself from the 1770s onwards. This is extensively common. Oh, All right, the how are they made? Well, in this case, Trisha's right here, so she's the person that can give you information if you have any questions okay. afterwards. But for our purpose as living historians, we've used trade blankets that we have had made, uh, very similar to the original documentation. 
for, you can cut some corners if you can't get those blankets, because they are hard to get. You can get them from people like Robert Stone as well. He does a great job for blankets. You can uh, use some of the older uh, Whitney blankets, Whitney Point blankets. Often they're sky blue. Sometimes you can find a darker one. But as you saw in the French Canadian images, there's a variety of shades of blue and a variety of colors of blanket. Just in the military case, it is blue of some sort. Uh, we've seen that we use the rosettes potentially to raise up the bottoms of it to tie. Uh, we're interpreting that as not necessarily being rosettes as on a gorget that I have here because there's not much to support it just being adorned uh, with this, but having more of a practical usage. Ties going down the front and the cuffs can actually fold. You can unfold the cuffs to cover your hands completely. Uh, my son Alfonso likes to joke around that it's like one of the minions, not minions, uh, one of the villagers in Minecraft because their hands go together. <laughs> but the cuffs actually completely come undone so you can actually put your hands through and keep them warm. Uh, if the mittens themselves aren't enough. Uh, they're pretty easy to construct. Again, Trisha give you more example, but there's no reason why we can't be using them. They're simple, they're plentiful, highly well documented, and we have the resources readily available in the community in order to produce them if necessary. The Canada cap is an interesting one. Uh, the Canada cap, as worn here by one of our members, Aaron, uh, it is basically made of a wool body with a fur lining inside and out. The fur can actually be turned up to protect, sorry, turned down to protect the ears if necessary in the back of the neck or left up if it's a little bit warmer. Uh, these are extensively used as well. Uh, we can see in one of the German accounts from 1778 that he's actually ordering that all his men be outfitted with green cloth Canada caps, and they are saying caps of the Canadian or Canada caps. In this case, they're also adorning them with feathers. So they're not just simple. We can see here, they're wearing green coats, um, the uh, dramatic gentleman that we're talking about, and their Canada caps are green. In this case, they're asking for links and associated creatures, so shorter hair, not necessarily something like a beaver, but something that can trap fur, sorry, trap uh, heat and not just um, expel water or prevent water from coming in. So beaver doesn't work well, but something like a rabbit, a lynx, a coyote, a fox, that's the type of fur they were calling for and the type we're seeing. Specifically, the dormant we're seeing there's actually uh, black feathers being added to the Canada cap. So they're not simple. You can actually have them far more complicated than what we have here, but it does look like a fur-bearing creature like a, a lynx or a coyote. It is fully lined in fur. They have a whole body and the colors do tend to match the colors of the uniforms themselves. We have been able to produce these, copying the period imagery that we have. Going back to Von German, we have a good example, and people like to joke around about the tails in Canada caps, that the tails themselves uh, might not be something that's present, but we do see that in Von German. It is very clear there is a tail in that case. Uh, Montgomery's attack, uh, the painting by John Trumbull. It did come later in 1786, but it's based upon, upon accounts from the period. And you can actually see wonderful uh, depictions of the Canada caps. Uh, in this case, we see variations in the color of fur, so we know it's coming from a few different creatures. And we see reds as well as uh, oranges for the wool, which again, are supported. But in this case, this is the Americans using it. Highly possible. This is not something that's exclusive just to the British. The French Canadians were using this. People in contact with the French Canadians would be adopting it as we looked at earlier. So Americans using something like the Canada cap isn't just likely, it's proven. Uh, we have records of this, of it being captured at places such as Chambly, where they're taking blanket coats and Canada caps from the British soldiers. So Americans most definitely had the information necessary to prove it, and we have accounts supported as well. So not just for the British. Well, how common are they? Again, <coughs> The uh, 7th Regiment of Foot had their, uh, their Canada caps actually cop captured from them. And we see this in uh, Air Force's American Archives Returns of Clothing. 1783, General Story Returns of Quebec, 55 red Canada caps. 1778, Quebec once again, 11 Canada caps. 79, Quebec, we're noting that there's Canada caps present. Quebec again in 1781, 123 red Canada caps. So in this case, all red, but they are dispersed throughout the province. They are being used extensively. And we can see examples of it once again. A four-pieced red shell, 
often a fur tuft of some sort on the top and the lining. For ours, we used rabbit, uh, which was actually sourced in Ontario, funny enough, right by where we live. Uh, so we're using materials that we had access to. And it's the same red that comes from one of the British coats. There's no difference. I'm not saying that's the case, but in theory, you can even recycle the coat or something of that nature to get the material. It doesn't use very much at all, because again, you're lining it with the fur, you're not lining it with the uh, wool itself. And it makes it far, far warmer in this case. Uh, they are quite comfortable, and they're actually good even the fall weather as well when it's not quite as cold. The fur still allows it to breathe quite a bit. Now mittens. Mittens is something that I have a personal pet peeve with. I see people using mittens that aren't at all documented. Um, when we do have quite a bit of information in terms of documentation, uh, we can see when it comes to uh, French, uh, they have extensive uh, patterns such as in, I believe this one was Diderot. Yeah, it was Diderot's uh, mitten pattern, which shows us how they're actually designed and how they're constructed. Uh, we then have the wreck of the General Carlton of Whitby in 1785, which shows us knit mittens. But the mittens in all cases, and you can see, they're all closed. No fingers are exposed. They are mittens, they're not gloves. Your fingers together preserves body heat. Having them separate in fingered gloves, like you have in most cases now, means you're actually losing that concentration of body heat. You can lose your fingers. It doesn't serve much of a purpose. The Sewn mittens, as you can see in Diderot, for a better example of it, actually have the seam on the outside as well. They're not churned in, if I'm not mistaken, that's more of a 19th century uh, practice where they started doing it. I think it was, we saw 1850s where they were actually putting them aside. I mean, even leather gloves in the 20th century, they had the seams on the outside. Yeah, the seams are pretty much on this outside. side. We're seeing, again, the same 1780s uh, picture of Canadians wearing the exact style of uh, mittens that we're finding earlier in the Diderot pattern. Well, Harley's actually made. Von Posh is very clear about that. One pair of blue lined with corduroy material. It's that simple. Blue wool mittens lined with corduroy material. Um, corduroy has also been translated in some other versions of his journal as strong wool. But again, we're seeing a simple blue in this case with another material inside. Nothing complicated, nothing expensive, so there's no reason why we can't be using this. And again, as noted, we actually have primary records of this being used in the context of the North by forces allied with the British. How common are they? Well, again, we're going back to the order given by uh, Haldeman, where thousands of soldiers are being equipped with these as uh, late as 1780. Earlier on, 17, uh, 1778, we can see in Montreal, casks, and each cask has about, well, enough that altogether we have about 380 pairs of mittens. Uh, further down in the magazine of Quebec, we have another 297, so we have almost, or roughly, uh, 600 mittens just in Quebec City being given to regulars. 1778, we see another 700 pairs of mittens in Quebec City. Another 375 uh, in St. John, Sorel, another 100 pairs. Quebec City again in 1779, 5,467 pairs of mittens. So we know how they're made. We know that, in fact, there are almost 6,000 pairs in Quebec City in 1779. So again, are they common? Yes. So much so that I argue not using would actually be an inaccuracy. How are they made? You got several options. Trisha now makes a pattern of uh, sewn mittens, and I mentioned that because there are actually very few sewn mitten patterns out there. It's very cheap, so it's one option. You can access it for very little. I think it's something like five dollars US. So it's very affordable to get the pattern. Mara Riley has the great pattern as well for the knit mittens. And as you see, you can use scraps. These are made from the leftovers of making my uniform. Uh, in many cases, we've actually used strong wool from the blankets, from the cutoffs of blanket coats. Uh, some of them have been made with a strong corduroy, but regardless, these are often scraps that you're using. It's very cheap to put these together, and if you don't have materials, you can do a group buy to purchase it. So we have the numbers, we have the documentation, they're very easy, but one thing to remember, the seams are on the outside. Don't turn them inside out, that's more of a modern approach. And you're not Tiny Tim. 
Okay, so please stop using the tiny pen fingerless gloves. They are accurate for the 19th century. Funny enough, they're also accurate for certain parts of the 1600s. We do see some Dutch examples of them, but we are not Dutch. This is not the 1600s. Things change. Things come in fashion and they go out of fashion, right? I'm not wearing bell bottoms. No, I mean, I don't wear them anyway. But I'm not wearing bell bottoms during the regular day, but some people have them. I might look good in bell bottoms. But the point is, things come in and out of fashion, and it is not in fashion at this point in time, and it's not the case until the 1830s onwards. So, fingerless mittens, as, as much as you might want to use them, don't. Take off your glove, put it in your belt thing, and fire with that one hand. Your other one's perfectly fine uh, holding the musket. There's no reason to do it. As we start wrapping things up, we have snowshoes. Their origins, well, it's pretty clear. They come from the indigenous communities. Where we are right now, we're looking at the Huron St. Lawrence style. Uh, snowshoes have been widely available. We have a pair over here, uh, three of them, from the, from the uh, Museum of History in Canada, showing pretty much the style we're talking about, the St. Lawrence Huron snowshoe. They are slightly more narrow at the tip, sorry, at the, at the top. They widen as we go through using sinew bindings or raha bindings, and they get more narrow. Almost like a, uh, like a beaver's tail, but a lot more accentuated. And I, and I want to point that out that it is not quite like a beaver's tail because there's a beaver tail style. That's not the one that's present on uh, Lake Ontario. So places like Niagara, even during the French regime, this is what we should be using because this is what the indigenous community in the area used. This is what we know was being given to soldiers uh, at various points in time because they were adapted off of what they had access to in the area. It is saintly, specifically St. Lawrence Huron style of snowshoe. Well, how do we know what they were actually using? Well, we have examples of that, again. Uh, the same hunter speaking we're looking at, 1722. We can see a form of that snowshoe being used by a French Canadian. 1780s, again, you can see a similar type of snowshoe being used by a French Canadian. But one of my favorites, uh, James uh, William Peachy, a Peachy uh, watercolor at Montmorency, uh, just north of Quebec City, and I believe it's 1781. When you zoom in in the high resolution image, you get a lot of information that people actually aren't aware of. One, the guy actually has rather high leggings. In fact, higher than mine, it looks like some sort of ties coming up. But they are closed rather tight. They form to the lake, which is interesting. It could be a variation of these. Uh, there are no moccasins, which is highly debatable. We know French Canadians used them earlier on. We know indigenous people used them earlier on. We have no proof whatsoever to this point that is documented of the British actually using moccasins with their snowshoes. I know it's controversial because a lot of people like to say, well, it would break the snowshoe, but we're seeing here in this example that they are solid black. And there are actually multiple individuals in the painting and they're all being portrayed as black. And it's not just a selection of color because they ran out. When you look at other football wear in the painting, it is different. When you look at other peachy images, he differentiates, despite being watercolors, very carefully in terms of what he's using for each color. These are black. These are black shoes. These are not moccasins. So in the absence of evidence, and we do have some evidence, we're looking at specifically, he's wearing shoes with the snowshoe. Which, for those who do living history, that's actually quite debatable, but this is what we have. This is the only evidence we have at the moment. How do we know we were actually using that places like Niagara? We actually have documentation. Thank you to, uh, thanks to Dustin Clement from the Carlton Papers. We actually have a letter from 1770, May 12th, just after the Light Company of the Eighth is formed and we are at Fort Niagara, they are sending over powder horns, but they are also sending over 60 pairs of, of uh, snowshoes to be used specifically by the King's Regiment. This is not just an order sending them to Niagara, it specifically says 60 pairs to be made use of by the King's Regiment in 1770. So that early on, the British are already starting to adapt to their environment and they're giving their soldiers snowshoes specifically to make use of in Niagara. So we know what they look like, we know how they're using them, and we know they've been given them. 60 pairs that early on, that's pretty extensive. Well, how do we use them? We've tried, yeah, you have a question. That was the question. Oh, how do we use them? Well, you have to actually bind them to your foot. Uh, there are various ways of doing that. I'm not gonna show you today because it's pretty extensive and we don't have the snow, so I don't wanna break my snowshoes, even though I have five pairs. But you actually put your foot on them 
you run ties, leather, twill, anything of that nature, even strips, and you're basically wrapping it around your leg, up above your ankle, and then putting it down. We can see that it does work with snowshoes, sorry, with uh, with regular shoes, and it does work with the moccasins if you were to try it. In this case, we experimented with the rumored blind version. Uh, I can tell you that using them in the snow, uh, we didn't get very far uh, with the moccasins. It started to seep through the moccasin after about 20 minutes, even with the snowshoe, and then it started to freeze. And at that point, we actually had to take off the snowshoes because we weren't playing around. We actually were in the woods. You can get very seriously injured, so we switched to the shoe. The shoe lasted far longer. Aaron, we were up for what, two, three hours, if not more? Our shoes were, were dry with the snowshoes, even barefooted, as long as we had black ball. That's a combination of uh, fats and uh, waxes. It protected the shoe. So I can't actually be in favor of the, of the moccasin with it because it, it didn't work in our case. Yep. Sorry, I didn't realize okay. my question is different. In terms of make use of, mm -hmm. is that um, as soon as you clear the clock, the volume went up and it's like, uh, uh, <laughs> like when they're following the picket and they're just doing garrison. Okay. That's a great question. Why do they wear them? Why do they not wear them? Uh, so, I know from the image of Montmorency that these gentlemen look like they're on patrol, they're further back, they are armed, they have their cartridge box and they have their musket, and they look attentive. So they could be on some sort of patrol. Uh, obviously if we're going to get, if we're going to encounter an enemy force, that means we're going to be using what we have on us at that point in time, so they would be using them in theory in combat at that point. Outside of that, they would likely be able to use them anyways, because we're seeing that civilians are using them generally. So if you're using them on a patrol or some sort of picket, and you're encountering the enemy, you're using that case, obviously you're going to use them as well just for daily, regular use. But they're used in deep snow. Um, I think we tried in like one inch or something like that. It wasn't very effective and lots of people snowshoe. Not you worth the trouble. <laughs> nah, not worth the trouble. You need something like a half foot of snow at least or more. At which point the excess energy used makes it worthwhile. Yep. So I assume units never meet each other in deep snow. So no one is ever wearing these when they're forming a line. And <laughs> oh, they have. Uh, they have met each other in some cases. Yeah, I mean, they're, they're wearing them on raids into the Mohawk Valley. Um, there's actually a really good quote from uh, Haudenosaunee chief warning the Americans that um, in the winter of 1778 that he's got big shoes and he's watching them in the winter. <laughs> which is, the, the warning is, we'll, we'll come. And they can. Yeah, and what we're portraying here this weekend, in theory, it's actually based off of uh, Oswegawachi, uh, where the, I believe it was first New York encountered the British at the fort in 79, I believe it was. Um, and in that case, there was deep snow. And if you've ever been up to Augsburg, which is where the fort is, it gets thick and it gets deep. And if you don't have snowshoes, you're falling right through the snow. You just can't operate. It is impossible to operate with two or three feet of snow, which is what they're seeing, unless you have snowshoes. Like, it just does not work logistically. You're going. Well, that battle was April 26th. Yeah. So that was that was that late. Yeah, and they, they were fighting in snow. That's what they're saying. There was snow in April. Yeah. So I've never worn snow. So I imagine they're really cumbersome. So how does maintaining a line, you know, and uh, like formations work? Yep. Yeah. When Excellent. everyone is Excellent walking question. extremely clumsily. Well, we're no longer walking in close formations at this point in time, right? Most of the army is operating like light infantry. So you're going to be operating at extensions. You don't have to necessarily worry about that. And thankfully, I'm duck-footed, uh, so I don't have much of a problem. But you're actually walking pretty much like this. In your foot, duck-footed, pretty much like skis, right? Uh, it's pretty easy to use, but it does use quite a bit of energy, so you're not moving as fast. But it's a lot better than trying to walk without snowshoes in three feet of snow. So it makes it more efficient. And it's a lot of fun trying this out with full kit. All right, one of the last items is sleep under waistcoat. Just something to throw in. Again, we see a bomb posh, November 9th, 1776. One large under waistcoat with sleeves made of strong white wool. We're not seeing, this is not a, a stocking uh, waistcoat where you actually take stockings, you attach it. This is an undersleeved waistcoat, a term that was available in the period. And we're seeing Bob Posh specifically actually noting that his soldiers, in this case artillery, are being given them in 1776. So this is an experimental thing. We don't know if the King's Regiment wore them. Von Posh worked with them. We now know what they're made out of. Uh, strong white wool. So we created an experimental version if you're interested in taking a look later. We used corduroy, because again, we saw translations that it's strong white wool might actually mean corduroy and vice versa. So we had just a regular buttons because we tried buttons and toggles. It's very difficult to put under a regular waistcoat. It's unpleasant. It hurts, to be honest, when you have all that belting and everything on. And then just the corduroy sleeves. It's very warm. I don't have it on today because, surprisingly, 
unless you're getting to temperatures of minus 20 Fahrenheit, uh, the blanket coat is great. Like we've gone out, most of the gentlemen out without it, we were rather comfortable. Uh, but when you're getting that low, then you want the undersleeve waistcoat. It's another layer above your shirt, below your waistcoat, below your regimental, and below the blanket coat. So lots of extra layers. And like I said, we experimented with it. It worked marvelously, so well that I wouldn't use it unless it's below minus 20. It just gets that hot. All right, what about for women? Well, it's not my area of expertise. Uh, my wife can clarify if I make any mistakes, but there are a lot of options. Uh, often, you're using fingerless mitts of wool, so they are pretty much cut off over here. Some of the ladies actually have them, if you want to see examples of it. So, pretty simple. You can make them out of wool or linen. You can look at them closer later on. It comes to a point. And you want to have your fingers free so you can actually do work, like sewing and other intricate uh, types of crafts. We have quilted petticoats, which are petticoats made out of wool that are actually looking like quilts. Again, Trish has one on. Mine's full. Oh, hers is full, but she has a quilted petticoat. It's thicker, and it's trapping that air in those little pockets. We have woolen cloaks with and without hoods, but as we can see in the French Canadian examples, they do in fact have hoods, and uh, they come around the shoulders as well. Uh, they don't wear blanket coats. There's absolutely no proof that I've seen so far written or image-based of women ever wearing blanket coats in French Canadian or in uh, British contexts. So it kind of sucks, but you have to wear a cloak. I mean, there are situations where you have to make do with what you have, and that's obviously what the case might be, but documentation-wise, I can't recommend wearing a blanket coat because I've never seen it, but I have seen folks extensively. We have wool bed gowns, just like the regular bed gowns. Uh, some of the ladies here might be wearing one, but it's made out of wool, so it keeps you that much warmer. We have uh, layered moccasins. Uh, sometimes you hear accounts of more than one layer of moccasin being worn. It prevents that, once that one layer gets wet and frozen, it should, in theory, prevent that second layer from getting uh, wet. So we're definitely seeing that. And you're just down to your basics, like wool stockings. Yes? Um, are the cloaks ever double-breasted? Are the what, sorry? Double-breasted, so they help with the wind. Oh, the men's coats? No, the, the women's cloaks. No. Oh, no. They're, 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 like the, yeah, the there are like versions that have a waistcoat built in. Yeah. There's like one or two existing ones, but they're very rare. Um, but most of the time, it's just breezy. <laughs> I find like if I if I like cover yeah, I mean, it, it's it, not bad. And, uh, it does cover you. There are versions that have slits in them, so that you can stick your hands out while still keeping the the cloak closed. Um, that also helps. I'm gonna get to why that's important later on, but we're also seeing head coverings in some images. This one is debatable. We're seeing something black underneath the hood, so potentially she has one of her handkerchiefs. Which she does have black, this French Canadian woman are using them around her head. Uh, in theory, right? It's black, very specifically drawn, so it's there for a reason. There are images where we've seen them around the women. And depending on your class, like middle, upper class, you have muff, which is pretty much a tube with fur on the outside and stuffed. Uh, oh, we have one over here. Ooh, that's a very nice one. <laughs> So, when it comes down to it, and this is the point, yeah, it sucks to be a woman in the 18th century in the winter, right? But you're not working out in the farm in many cases. That type of work has already been finished. In the late fall, it's going to be uncomfortable, but you have some things to keep you warm. But you're not necessarily going out for miles walking around, right? You're hunkering down, even for the men, in the winter. And in the context of places like the fort, they're doing their duties, they're coming in. They're not necessarily staying out as long unless it's necessary. So it's unpleasant? Yes. Will you get used to it? Yeah, I'm actually kind of used to the fact that I have no blanket coat right now. It's not that bad. I'm cold, but I've gotten used to it. So it's something we have to get used to. It's not always comfortable in the 18th century, but that's the reality of what it is. And if we're trying to copy the 18th century to replicate it authentically, no tiny Tim mittens, it didn't exist. No blanket coats, because we know they didn't wear them. So what does this actually mean? What's the point of me doing this and wanting to come to places like this? It's to educate people because I love talking to people. I've actually quit my regular job uh, that I had before in law and I became a teacher because I love it. But as far as reenacting goes, seasons don't exist. They don't need to end. The seasons when you change the clothing, not when you stop supporting places like Wolf Fort Niagara. Right? We have lots of people coming through today. We have lots of our friends here. We just need to make sure that we're equipped the way they were so we can survive. And as I said, when it comes to undersleeved waistcoats, blanket coats, mittens, snowshoes, Canada caps, it is actually surprisingly comfortable during the day. So 
remember slept in a North Cornell. <laughs> Apparently there wasn't much sleep. But you just have to prepare for the season to do things accurately and safely. There's no reason why we need to stop in the winter. Our friends in the Jersey Grays are now putting together winter impression as well. They have blanket coats for the American impression. They have mittens. I gave them the pattern for that. And I've been talking to James about it as well. So even on the American side, they're starting to adapt, be ready for the winter, because they know we're coming for them. <laughs> Everyone in the eighth has a blanket coat, so they need to catch up. Awesome. If anyone has any questions or likes to see something up close, please, uh, please do so. Uh, I'm more than happy to answer the questions for you and to let you handle things as well.